Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third of four public meetings as we work collectively on a master plan for our Hellam Hills Conservation Area. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Impact with the Lancaster Conservancy. Our department handles the marketing, education, volunteer initiatives, and development for the organization. We invite all of you to get out into nature and enjoy the benefits our properties have to offer. The Lancaster Conservancy is a private land trust founded in 1969, 53 years ago by hunters, anglers, and naturalists that were concerned about the loss of forested land along the Susquehanna River. Today, we have protected over 8,000 acres on 50 nature preserves. These preserves are left in their natural state with a strategy to manage them for the public to use while also working toward their highest and best ecological value. We are not creating parks with amenities like ball fields and playgrounds. We are protecting these forested lands for their biodiversity with limited infrastructure put in place to enhance and welcome the community. Tonight, we're excited to share with you initial plans for the design and management of two new nature preserves, Hellam Hills and Wizard Ranch. Your interest and feedback is critical to the long-term success of these plans. Please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. There will also be a Q&A session following the presentation. As a reminder, tonight's presentation is being recorded and will be made available on our website for future viewing. With over 1,000 acres between Hellam Hills and Wizard Ranch Nature Preserves, this is the single largest area the Conservancy will open to the public. We take this responsibility seriously, which is why we engage a team of experts to assist with the planning phase of this project. The consulting team spent months studying the wildlife and observing the lay of the land to provide us with a set of recommendations that you will get to comment on this evening and during the next 60 days. This is the initial phase of planning. Once comments are received and the plans finalized, our stewardship team will take a phased approach to implementation. In other words, this plan will be implemented over many years to come. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Now it is my pleasure to hand the meeting over to Peter Simone from Simone Collins, who has led the planning team over the last nine months. Thanks, Fritz, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I hope you're somewhere uh, warm um, and uh, uh, safe tonight. Um, our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to take you through the 10 months of work that we've done um, and look at each of the two properties that make up Helen Hills Nature Preserve or Helen Hills Conservation Area, I should say, the Helen Hills Nature Preserve and the Wizard Ranch, and talk about some initial projects. And then we'll go, as Fritz said, we'll go into comments and questions, Q&A. And also, uh, you'll see at the end of the presentation, there'll be a survey monkey link where you can uh, give us um, additional questions over the next 60 days. And, and this presentation and a recording of this will be up on the Cons Conservancy website. So you can uh, look at it more leisure. We're not gonna mention everything on all these slides tonight, otherwise we'd be here for a very long time. So we're gonna give you an overview. Um, as Fritz mentioned, Simone Collins is the lead uh, firm, but we're working with also a, a bunch of other experts, RES, our ecological planners. We're gonna hear from Jesse Bruckner tonight, uh, uh, revision architecture, uh, Scott Kelly's with us, uh, Forested, um, uh, uh, Lincoln Smith uh, with that firm is with us. And then A.D. Marble uh, is going to be looking at some of the cultural and, and, and uh, uh, sort of permitting requirements. They're not with us tonight, but they'll be commenting on uh, the plan as we go forward. Or uh, in, 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 uh, in committee or in, in organization, steering committee includes some members of the Conservancy, many of which I, I, I know you uh, are familiar with. Uh, we have the National Park Service on this committee, York County, um, Hellam uh, Township, and uh, Lori Ike from the Bureau of, of uh, Recreation and Conservation, DCNR, uh, who provided some of the funding for the project. And on the right of the slide, you can see some of the many project partners uh, that we, we, we want to engage and will continue to engage as this project goes forward over the next several years. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, a master plan is, is just that. It's a, it's a concept level plan that sets a blueprint for uh, a number of years ahead. And if you follow that bar, bottom horizontal line, you can see we, we are at the, the, uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, draft plan uh, right now. And then we're gonna ask you for your comments over the next uh, couple of months. And then we'll make revisions to the plan and then have an approved final plan. And then the process is the conservancy will go back, secure funding, do design and engineering as necessary, and then implement parts of the plan. And this will be done uh, over several, many years with several phases. So this is not a, a one and done type of a project. This is a long-term, a very long-term management commitment on the part of the conservancy. And you can see the list of public meetings and key person interviews, and also some of the other ways that we've tried to uh, uh, elicit uh, public comment and input. Uh, over, the, over the last several months, as I mentioned, we've been working with you in the committee uh, and moving forward, you can just see here, our next public meeting, the final public meeting is scheduled for Mar March 30th. Hopefully that could be in person. And uh, there we'll, we'll share with you the final plans as they evolve over the next couple of months. Just quickly reviewing some of the public input we've had. The first public meeting, we had 150 people attending, which was tremendous. The survey that we ran had uh, over 300 responses. We've done 14 key person interviews. Uh, RES, our ecologists and scientists have been out to the site many times over a number of months. And the second public meeting in September, we had almost 100 people uh, attend and participate. So we, we think we've gotten pretty robust uh, participation from the community. In, in terms of our goals, um, really uh, for the conservation area, these are two very different sites. If you've been there, you know that. Uh, Helm Hills is, is, a, is, is a, a less impacted site by human, human actions. And here uh, we wanna preserve and enhance sensitive habitats. Doesn't mean we don't have work to do with enhancing and giving an ecological uplift to those habitats, but there it's more of a preserve and enhance mission. At Wizard Ranch, this has been a working landscape for many years and uh, quite frankly, Ecologically, it's not in great shape. Uh, and so this is gonna serve over the next decade or more, probably more a living classroom for uh, how to with ecological enhancement because there's a lot of work to be done there to bring that site back to uh, ecological health. Uh, so two sites, two different focuses uh, uh, for each one. In terms of the program, uh, we have some priorities here which, are, which go through both sites. Uh, in spe invasive species, as I'm sure you know, are uh, very important to, to re remove and manage over time. Uh, deer populations are out of control. We have to manage that. And then water resources is, uh, to manage those are very important in terms of uh, how water uh, flows to, through uh, the sites. Uh, three main uh, program areas that the Conservancy is going to embark on. One is stewardship which involves the things you see bulleted there. Another is trail development. How do we make this, these sites accessible to the public in a, in a safe way? We also have, I think, a very important emergency through trail that we're gonna feature at uh, the Helen Preserve that we think is important for the community. And, and then uh, certainly continuing with environmental education on both sites uh, with different uh, methods to do that. In terms of how we you know, started to determine what facility should happen here, we took a look at the region and we certainly didn't want to duplicate a lot of the great facilities that are in the Riverlands area. So we've inventoried those and our focus here is to provide uh, facilities and activities that aren't available in other places. So that was our focus in terms of activities that include passive recreation, or however you want to uh, describe those activities. The sites, uh, which you can see on this map, but also on this next map, they're two separate uh, parcels uh, on the Susquehanna River. Uh, as Fritz mentioned, they're over a thousand acres and each one has its own challenges and uh, characteristics that we will talk about this evening. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the uh, Hellam Hills uh, uh, Nature Preserve. And this is about uh, almost, almost 800 acres. Uh, the majority of it is forested. And uh, you, many of you may know, uh, uh, a lot of it was owned by the water company. They still have 
uh, water water uh, facilities there and maintain easements and maintain uh, emergency water supplies for some of the communities across the river. And so here, the, this site has evolved with really an unplanned, not necessarily bad, but unplanned use of hunting and hiking over the years, which the Conservancy through this plan uh, is seeking uh, to uh, formalize. And our goals and objectives here uh, really focus on the ecological health of the site. Uh, uh, watershed enhancement is going to be very important. I have already mentioned invasives removals, and you're going to hear that a lot tonight. We've got some great opportunities to regenerate forests and to create breeding bird habitats. And then the activities, are get, again, are focused on trails, so people have the opportunity for self-guided uh, exploration and also additional hunting opportunities, which you'll hear about later, and also emergency access through the site. So to tell us, give us a summary of some of the ecological analysis, I'm going to turn this over to Jesse Bruckner, who joins us from the, the hills of West Virginia, where she's been on site all day, uh, looking at another site. So Jesse, um, uh, uh, please, please go forward. Thanks, Pete. As Pete mentioned, I'm an ecologist with RES. We've been in a few of these public meetings, so we've gone over the ecological analysis a little bit more in depth before, and now we're kind of looking forward with what we can do with what's there. But just to give a little recap, we have a lot of areas of intact second growth canopy trees, but there's not a lot of hardwood here. And this is due to the things that Peter already mentioned. There's a lot of invasive species here, and there's a lot of intense deer browse. The deer just come in and eat everything. We've documented 148 vegetative species so far in this area. Only about 26 of them, 26 percent of them are invasives, but those 26 percent account for about 75 percent of the site-wide coverage. Some of the most important habitat types that we've found are the wetland seeps and the outcrop and bluff forests. Those are going to be our highest conservation concern as we're moving forward. While we were on site, we also discovered 68 bird species, which is a great number. It's a great migratory birding area in the spring. We saw a lot of great birds here. Next slide. So this is a fairly large area, as Pete said. So the way that we look at this is by dividing it into management units. So you can see on this map, we've divided it into five major management units, and there are subunits within these. And these divisions form the basis for our management recommendations and how we talk about this with each other in the report and how we're talking to you. We won't go into as detailed about that. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. We're, well, we're talking about our overall recommendations. They're divided into six categories, which are, as you can see here, meadow habitats, successional forest management, wetland floodplain restoration, the stream corridor restoration, selective tree removal and viewshed management, and trail restoration. We're also recommending that we extend hunting through the cooperative agreement with the Game Commission, firearms and bow and arrow north of Furnace Road to attempt to minimize the damage that's being done by the deer. The north facing slopes towards River Road will still not allow hunting. Next slide. So the stream and floodplain restoration is very important. You can see this highly eroded edge in this photo here. The conservancy needs to create a streamwide plan so we can improve the hydro hydrology and the in-stream associated wetlands and also explore the opportunities for creating mitigation banks, uh, which is places where new wetlands can be created and agencies buy those credits to offset work that's done elsewhere in the county. As we, as we keep speaking about, invasive management is a huge issue at Hellum Conservation Area in both preserves. In addition to controlling the deer herds, there needs to be mechanical removal of invasives. And once you've removed them, we also need to go in and replant with native species, which these will be both be long-term undertakings. In the areas north and east of Buzzard's Roost, the Norway spruce grove needs to be thinned uh, and removed in some places and then replanted with hardwoods. 
This includes white pines, oaks, birches, the things you can see on here. As we already mentioned, there, we've already seen a lot of great birds, but we can enhance that by increasing pollinator and breeding bird habitat. It's another initiative, one that's also impacted by beer, by deer, and the deer need to be called to increase this habitat. Next slide. And the final point is, there's, as we said, there's a lot of unplanned hiking in here. So there's a lot of trails from really small trails to larger lo old logging roads and reducing the trails or outright retiring some of the trails will also help us to regenerate these forests. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so now kind of keeping in mind those ecological recommendations um, that Jesse just kind of reviewed, we'll go into the activity recommendations. Um, and kind of what we looked at with site program for Helm Hills was really kind of focusing in on kind of the immediate needs of just site access and parking, um, currently something that is not offered within the preserve itself. Um, and then looking at kind of the hiking trail and really looking to simplify that trail system while still kind of hitting all the destinations within the site. Um, focusing on an emergency access through route that will bring us from Furnace Road down to River Road so that if sections of River Road are closed off, um, we have kind of an alternate route to get kind of ATVs through, um, as well as focusing on kind of educational programs. Um, so like a pavilion um, for meeting and gathering um, and rest a restroom kind of at a parking head. So we'll kind of look at how these play out in order. Um, again, just looking at those existing conditions, um, you currently have the Mason-Dixon Trail that runs through the site. Um, there is the Overlook Trail that runs parallel to a wildcat run. And then you have these kind of remnant logging roads shown in the brown. Um, to kind of what we're looking at again with those ecological recommendations and the trails um, overlaid. So in terms of site access, we're recommending three parking areas. Um, the first be kind of a new um, large um, parking area as kind of the entrance of the site. Um, we're looking at realigning the existing utility road that brings you down to the water access area. We're looking at realigning that driveway with Chimney Rock Road to create a new entrance into the park and then orienting a parking lot in that area of about 60 spaces. Um, and this can be phased in based on demand, um, but also kind of have a restroom in that area as well, most likely a composting toilet. Um, the second parking area we're looking at is kind of a trailhead parking area for about 20 cars um, that would allow access to the Mason Dixon Trail. Um, so that would be located along Furnace Road and then provide access if you were hiking west or east along the Mason Dixon Trail. And then last um, along Chimney Road to get access to the lands kind of on the south side of Furnace Road, looking at again another 20 space um, parking kind of trailhead parking area. In terms of the trail system itself, um, really the big player here is kind of rerouting the Mason Dixon Trail. So that really brings you throughout the site and allows you to kind of experience all the different aspects of the site itself. So initially the idea is to maintain the entrance off of River Road. Um, we're recommending that there be some wayfinding signage at that entrance that really delineates that you're entering into the preserve and kind of has a map so that you can understand where you're gonna go throughout the preserve. But maintaining that existing trail, um, instead of crossing over the Dugan Run into the utility access road, we're gonna create a new alignment along the south edge of Dugan Run and kind of bring people through that woodland area. Um, and this is part of that Norway spruce forest where we're really looking to kind of open up forest gaps and regenerate hardwood forests in that area. So it'll bring you past kind of that regeneration work. Um, cross kind of the headwaters of the Dugan Run. So we'll probably have kind of a boardwalk crossing through this enhanced wetland area and then bring you back up to that utility road. Um, there you would cross the utility road and kind of run up to Buzzard's Roost. Um, from that area kind of coming back down towards Wildcat Bluff um, where you can kind of go out to the overlook there and then bringing you back along what is formerly was the Observation Trail um, along Wildcat Run would now be the Mason Dixon and back up through Wildcat Run and then kind of down through some runes of the creek and then also past the former um, iron pits 
the mining pits in this area and then back out. Um, so that becomes kind of the main trail of the site. Um, secondary trails would be kind of the Buzzard Roost Overlook Trail. So you're seeing that in yellow, and this would be kind of an accessible trail that would bring you up to Buzzard's Roost. And then the other big idea is the red trail becomes that emergency access trail. So this would be a much wider trail um, where everything else we're kind of looking at hiking trails that would be kind of three to five feet wide. This would be kind of that five to eight foot wide trail bed to accommodate kind of an all terrain emergency vehicle um, to bring you through the site. Um, and again, we're taking advantage of the existing logging roads in the site to kind of maintain that corridor. Um, and then looking at kind of a third trail that would be kind of a loop trail that would bring you through kind of the fields and wetlands area and really kind of focus on um, birding and habitat um, up near the front end of the site. So in terms of kind of the features and facilities, I, we called out a bunch of them as we were going over kind of the Mason-Dixon Trail, um, but really looking at those restrooms at the main parking area, um, a pavilion located close to that area that would serve both kind of the birding trails and kind of as a gathering place um, for volunteers. Um, third, there's kind of some farmhouse rooms in this area that we would want to interpret. And then obviously kind of those high points of Buzzard's Roost, um, the overlook out in this area. One of the things we're looking at there is the idea of camping for through hikers along the Mason-Dixon Trail. So these would be um, reservation only camping sites um, for through hikers. And then also kind of an overlook area at Wildcat where you're kind of staying way above the creek here. There's some beautiful views into the woodlands and then some of those interpretation of runes and um, site history on the site as well. Again, looking at that hunting area. So again, with um, Hallam Hills, we're looking at the idea of maintaining the site for firearm and bow hunting, um, but really limiting um, the site so that no hunting would be allowed north of Wildcat Run. Um, so only the orange area south of the river, and then also avoiding those um, north facing slopes down to River Road where we kind of back up to residences. Um, so really keeping the hunting interior to the site and part of that will be paired with um, education and signage so that during hunting season, hikers um, know that they need to be wearing orange and are aware that hunting is going on on site, as well as educating hunters to the fact that hikers are um, allowed on site. So with that, I'm going to pass back off to Pete to kind of introduce us to Wildcat or Bluff. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Well, Wildcat Bluff, uh, it, along with Buzzard's Roost, is one of the, the coolest areas on the uh, Helm Hills Nature Preserve. And um, as you can see, uh, there's a, a residence there, and the views are right on the edge of the river, just above uh, the road, whereas Whereas Buzzard's Roost is a little bit, Buzzard's Roost is a little bit further away from the river, so we looked at three options here for uh, future use by the conservancy of this facility. Um, the the first potential use is to keep it as is, which is an existing residence, which you can see is number one there. Uh, there's existing parking, and then there's a long driveway that goes down to River Road. Um, and there is a access point below the residence there at number eight, which is the overlook area uh, that's open to the, to the public. And uh, you can hike in there from the trail system. And so, so you know, this is one option for continued use, but uh, the Conservancy wanted to look at and we suggested other options here. So the second option, number two, is to uh, use, if we go to the next slide, use this facility and repurpose it for conservancy uses. And those uses would be determined in the future. Could it be uh, offices? Could it be a educational spot where uh, folks could hike into the site? Uh, we, we really don't want to create lots of traffic on this driveway because it's very narrow and very steep. So it would probably be a hike in only. We'd, I'm sure we could have handicapped parking there for folks with disabilities who, who wanted to come. So this could be educational. It could be, have a lot of uses, maintaining you know, the house, um, having a, uh, a, 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 a an, and then with the public use at this house, we could have a, an upper overlook also with a small boardwalk to an overlook, which would give folks more opportunities to enjoy what is a, an amazing and very dramatic view over the river. 
And then the third option is sort of deconstructing the house a little bit and, and turning that house into an open air pavilion. And again, still allowing people to hike in there primarily. Um, and uh, the Conservancy could do some educational programs uh, occasionally here, but just having it as an open air structure uh, uh, type of thing where, where it's uh, just less, less maintenance and not having a, a, a full house there. So those are the, so those are the three options that the Conservancy is considering. Um, uh, I don't think the Conservancy knows yet and which option will be uh, uh, most useful. If you have opinions on that, certainly, um, you know, let us know as you uh, respond to the survey monkey link at the end of the presentation, where you can give us your thoughts. So, uh, and this is a great, a really amazing place to uh, uh, view the river and the whole, the whole uh, river valley. So now we're going to move on to um, uh, uh, visit the Wizard Ranch section of the Hallam Hills Preserve. And this is smaller than the Hellam Hill section, it's about 250 acres. Uh, we've got a number of uh, hay fields here that total approximately 70 acres. And, and, it, and if you're familiar with the area, every few years, the Boy Scouts have a, a safari or a jamboree here, and they use these fields for camping. Uh, that use is going to continue into the future. Uh, as you may know, the Conservancy uh, uh, obtained the site from, from the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, so, so our, our uses and our uh, plans for the site would maintain that use uh, over time. In terms of our, our goals and objectives, um, I mentioned earlier, this is a working landscape because it's, it's been highly disturbed. And uh, I think uh, somebody on one of our site visits made a comment that this is one of the most highly disturbed sites uh, that the Conservancy uh, owns. So there's a lot of work to be done here. So uh, some of the things you see listed here are watershed demonstration enhancements. Um, this is also going to be where the, the Conservancy would like to develop a hub for stewardship. They'll have, you'll see in a few slides later, uh, uh, we're planning a, a, a modest maintenance facility here with some offices uh, and some places where we could do outdoor um, education and things like that. So this is going to be the public face of the Lancaster Conservancy in York uh, County. Also, the Conservancy already has some funding to do some uh, bat and nesting bird habitat improvements, which would be one of the early projects. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this will continue to be a, uh, an occasional uh, site for the Boy Scouts when they have their events here. So uh, we're going to go back to Jesse to take us through some of the analysis and recommendations ecologically for the Wizard Ranch. Thanks, Pete. So as we said before, uh, Wizard Ranch is a different site than Hellam Hills. The recommendations are similar in a lot of ways, but even more intensive given the disturbed nature of this landscape when compared to the Hellam Hills preserve side. At Wizard, streams, wetlands, and riparian areas have the highest value. Here, invasives cover roughly 85% of the site. And while we saw 80 species of birds, which is more birds than we saw at Helm, there were no grassland birds, which we were surprised about considering the number of fields, but this just speaks to the uh, poor habitat value of those hayed fields. Next slide. So as we saw with Helm Hills, we also divided this into management units, which are based on the ecology. The characteristics divided themselves into six major management units with subcategories, and this is how we created our management recommendations. Generally, these create five categories of recommendations. Meadow habitat, forest invasive management, wetland floodplain restoration, stream corridor restoration, and successional forest management. Next slide. So the stream and flood floodplain restoration includes some unique things based on the history of the land use at Wizard. For example, this man-made pond that you can see in the photo should be transitioned into a wetland and reconnected to the adjacent stream. There are many opportunities at Wizard for significant habitat enhancements. 
due in part to their very poor existing conditions. Like at Hellum, banking these efforts for mitigation for offsite projects is a possibility. As you can see in this photo here, again, we have a really big issue with invasive species. There's horrible existing condi conditions here. So one of the high, the high priorities is going to be removal and then seeding of natives. If you're removing a lot of things, you need to seed over top of them, otherwise the invasives will just come back. This is a long-term and a painstaking task. In regards to bats, we'd like to monitor and determine which species are there to inform the special ecology, to know which trees we can remove and which to leave in place during this work. And again, just stressing invasives, invasives, invasives. Wizard has a lot of removals to do and a lot of replanting along with deer culling. These things will be key. And while this work is happening, we'd like to continue to monitor breeding birds so we understand what's working, what's not, and how we can keep doing this iteratively in the best way possible. And for the meadows, the many meadows that do exist at Wizard are a great opportunity for ecological uplift. There's a lot of non-native hay and non-native grasses that can be replaced by native species, which will create great bird habitat and they'll still serve the Boy Scouts well during their occasional jamborees. There's a lot of opportunity within this area. And I'll pass it back to you. Great, we're gonna go to Lincoln uh, for his agroforestry uh, review and recommendations, Lincoln. All right, hi, yeah, I'm Lincoln. I design um, when looking at agroforestry options for the site in consultation with the ecological assessments. And uh, agroforestry, for those that are unfamiliar, is uh, agricultural techniques with a heavy emphasis on trees that have the dual goals of producing something for people and achieving ecological restoration. Um, so it's a special form of agriculture in that sense. And we're looking at four different possible techniques around this Wizard Ranch property. The first marked with the A there is around the stewardship hub. And this would be a food forest, uh, which I'll go into a little more detail on the next slide. B and C are woody florals and live stakes uh, for use on the uh, conservancy properties and projects. And D is an area for production of poles, growing of tree species for use uh, for poles. Next slide. So a food forest is a special type of planting which is multi-layered and features a lot of the native crops that grow uh, in, in our local forest ecosystem. So this would be a, a planting designed with paths and benches and signage so that visitors to the site can enjoy and learn about uh, the crops that are being grown. Uh, there are many crops that can be suitable for this site, including some fruit that people know about and some that they might encounter for the first time when arriving. Uh, but besides the, the fruit crops that people might harvest, a food forest includes a lot of native plants that are there for other ecological benefits like wildlife habitat, insect uh, support, and uh, also plants that are there to build soil. So it's a, it's a holistic and diverse planting. It's a way of, of asking the question, how can we produce our food in the most ecologically sound manner possible? How can we work with the forest ecosystem to produce food for people? Um, there's more and more evidence that the Native Americans that, that have lived here were very good at this, that they were working with the local ecosystem to derive everything that they needed to live. Uh, and so we're trying to, trying to learn something about how uh, they were doing this. And I think it, it will be uh, engaging to the visitors to Wizard Ranch. So moving on to the next area. Woody florals. There are a number of our native species that offer great use to the floral trade uh, for, for um, decorative purposes. 
it's interesting to note that uh, while they're beautiful, the, the roses and, and other things that we can buy in the florist shop, they do have a pretty high embodied energy, a lot of them having been flown from South America or other places. So it's, it's fun to realize that there are a bunch of native plants that provide um, ornamental uh, cut stems similarly. And the, and the way these are grown, uh, when they are harvested, they are not destroyed because they're woody. They can be cut and then regrow. So they're serving an important ecological function of holding the soil and providing wildlife habitat like the winter berry that you see on your screen uh, and also can be a useful um, product for the floral for floral use. Next slide, please. The next area that we're looking at would be a project in conjunction with a re wetland restoration that is needed uh, so desperately in the streams on Wizard Ranch. So uh, these are erosive areas and full of invasive species, as Jesse was was pointing out, and they need to be stabilized. And a lot of that work is done by certain native plants that are that are uh, good at holding soil. Together with that, though, we can use this area as a way to produce live stakes that can be then used on other Lancaster Conservancy properties for, for additional wetland uh, restoration projects. So it's pretty neat because uh, some of these species like willows and dogwoods, elderberry, you can cut a stem of that plant and then simply drive it into the ground in another location and it will start to grow and rapidly stabilize that soil. So by configuring the the uh, wetland restoration project at Wizard Ranch uh, for accessibility and harvest, we can both stabilize the soil there and uh, give ourselves a leg up on, on subsequent uh, restoration projects. And the final agroforestry technique we're looking at would be located on a hillside, sort of in the upper part of the property, where the, the, the existing forest is highly impaired. Uh, it is almost 100% invasive species, um, you name it. It includes a lot of uh, elanthus, for example. So this forest is in need of a lot of work. And it provides an opportunity for us to do a pole uh, planting. Uh, this can include a number of species, one of which is black locust. Black locust is a, is a native plant that provides a lot of wildlife value. And because it's a legume, it, it builds up the soil, uh, enriching fertility on the site. Uh, but it produces a, a highly rot resistant pole that uh, traditionally has been used for fence posts and can be used on, um, on conservancy properties. It, the, the, these poles are as rot resistant as pressure treated wood, but they can be produced right here on site and not rather than transported and chemically treated uh, from other points around the world. So, uh, so there's a lot of potential here. And in each case with each of these agroforestry techniques, the, uh, the goal of, of forest restoration is, is uppermost. And anything that we're producing for people and for our use uh, needs to be in harmony with that. That, that, that is the... Uh, that's the main point of all of these things. What can we do to, to work with this forest ecosystem to appreciate and, and gently and thoughtfully use what the, what the forest can produce? Thank you, Lincoln. Um, so now we'll kind of, again, look at the activities um, for Wizard Ranch and how those kind of fit in with our ecological recommendations. Um, again, with the site program here, um, we are looking at the idea of a stewardship center, and we'll kind of go into detail of this, but really it will serve as a place for um, the Conservancy to run their crews out of um, for this region of their lands. Um, also, looking at kind of the existing infrastructure on site, there's two stone cabins that we want to kind of make sure we incorporate those into the future of the preserve. Um, looking at the existing social trails and seeing how we can kind of develop a trail system that will support the educational programs of the preserve. So really like looking more at kind of short loop trails that lend themselves to educational or educational and visitor programs. Um, Lincoln looked over the agroforestry. 
Um, and then also we'll kind of again look at the idea of some camping for Mason Dixon through hiking and then how we kind of incorporate kind of those meadows and floodplain restoration areas into the overall site. So again, first we'll just quick remind you of the existing conditions. So you do have the central stream um, that runs through the site. There's two upper branches and then it combines in the central valley of the site and runs down towards the Susquehanna River. Um, there is one gravel road off of Accomack Road that kind of brings you down and crosses actually two parts of that stream. So there's two different crossings um, and that runs up to the upper meadow. And then also a remnant of that road brings you into the central meadow. Um, we do have those 70 acres of kind of hay field currently and then the rest of the site is prominently forested. In orange, you're kind of seeing those remnants of social trails. And these are really just kind of mown paths or old farm roads um, throughout the site. So in terms of access, what we're looking at is building upon the existing um, central road, but looking at relocating it slightly away from private residents here. Um, so kind of recentering that central drive. And then also looking at one single crossing of um, the floodplain corridor um, down through the valley. So re-engineering that road across the stream. And that would be paired with the wetland and floodplain restoration work that is central to the site. Um, in terms of parking, we are looking at kind of parking at the Stewardship Center, um, which is located in this area. Um, general visitor parking at number three and looking at the idea of accommodating 55 spaces. Um, and again, that might be phased in as the site becomes more active. Um, and then looking at a lower parking lot down near the floodplain area. So again, to provide kind of accessible access down to these networks of trails in this area, since there is a drastic grade change between kind of the upper fields and that lower stream valley. Um, last, we do have kind of emergency access area. Um, this is a current kind of logging road access up through the site. Um, so that would be maintained for ATV emergency access. Looking at the trail system, um, again, we wanted to make sure that the system ties into the Mason-Dixon Trail. So we did look at the idea of having that emergency access serve as a extension trail off of the Mason-Dixon that would bring you up into the site um, and you could do kind of a loop hike and come back down onto the main trail. Um, up in that great meadow, again, looking at the idea of having a remote campsite um, that would serve Mason-Dixon through hiking. Um, in terms of the other trails, they're all kind of geared at individual um, portions of the site. Um, the central trail kind of being that stream loop. Um, and here the idea is that having kind of a combination of boardwalks um, and kind of stable trail surfaces to have a truly accessible trail experience along that stream and wetland corridor area. Um, looking at kind of a new trail system that would bring you um, along the main primary channel of the stream and kind of loop back up through the meadows. Um, we're kind of referring to that as the Accomack Creek um, Loop Trail. Um, and then kind of looking at existing trails that really bring you up through that kind of hardwood forest area um, and back into the upper reaches of um, the secondary channel. And this is that area where um, there were some nice kind of oak history, oak hickory forest. So it really kind of lets you see a different type of environment. Um, and then also looking at kind of that main food forest loop trail up near the visitor center. So again, um, and we'll kind of zoom in on a blow up of the front area and kind of look at the um, kind of welcome center, stewardship center and educational pavilions in this area and how that parking and circulation works. Um, always looking at where we have entrances, trail entrances into the site, having that wayfinding signage at those points. And then we talked about kind of that camping up along the upper meadow there for the Mason Dixon Trail. Um, in terms of hunting on this site, um, here, since we see this as more of kind of an intensive kind of educational site, we're limiting, recommending the limited of hunting to bow and arrow. But again, kind of maintaining hunting off of the main ridge line and avoiding the areas that are kind of north facing down towards River Road. So really, that covers the majority of the site, but kind of limits those um, areas near the residences. 
So in terms of architectural recommendations here, this is a blow up of that existing road entrance. So you can see currently that driveway entrance is right adjacent to a private residence here. Um, we do have an existing stone cabin in this area. Um, one of the things that we looked at ecologically is the idea if you have these hedgerows, um, really kind of removing some of those hedgerows to kind of create one open ecological space um, in the front along Akamak Road. Um, and then as that road continues down, you have your first stream crossing along this um, tributary and then the second stream crossing here and then that existing man-made pond. Um, so here we're, we're really kind of looking to simplify how um, the engineered driveway really affects the floodplain um, as well as that engineered pond in this area. So in terms of the enlargement of the site plan here, um, you can see where we've kind of sh recommended shifting that driveway. Um, we can't shift it over too far because we do have some steep topography up along the road edge. Um, but this driveway kind of provides immediate access into what we're referring to as the stewardship center. Um, so this is key that we didn't want to put this too far into the site so that, you know, throughout the year and the winter months, um, the stewardship crews are easily able to get in and out of the site, um, but we wanted to make sure they kind of quickly had their trucks off of kind of the public road. So we've developed a loop road system, um, some small parking area for staff, about 14 spaces with some overflow parking that would be stabilized turf, and then bring you down into a um, working yard area where you'd have truck access. So we're looking at kind of a bank barn model with office space on the top and then the garages underneath. Um, in terms of public, how they would interact with the site, they again would use the main drive, but they would have access to the public parking lots over here. And the idea here is to kind of maintain the existing savanna. There's some mature tree coverage through here, um, but develop the parking lot kind of around those so that we really kind of segment it and break it up into the site instead of having one large parking lot. Um, and then kind of tucking down, having that existing cabin will work as the welcome center. And I'll pass off to Scott shortly. and He'll kind of go over those details. And then an educational pavilion with a central lawn that works for kind of program activities. Um, again, showing how the trail networks would come out um, from the site. Um, the road itself, we've reloaded. It used to kind of come over in this area. So the idea is to kind of regrade it so that it crosses just one time of the stream and so that double crossing and this would have to be paired with kind of that wetland restoration area that you're seeing in this blue hatch here um, but that would terminate at the um, lower parking area where we're looking at about 20 spaces and then from there it would be more of a wider trail kind of um, maintenance access road that would take you up to the other areas of the site so with that i'm going to pass over to scott to kind of walk us through the site architecture Okay, hey, thank you, Sarah, very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Kelly from Revision Architecture. Revision is a deep green sustainable architecture firm based in the Philadelphia area. We've got about a 12 year history with Lancaster County Conservancy, understanding the needs and the wants in the community. I'll take just a few minutes to talk about the building, about the orientation, about some of the design concepts, and some of the thinking. So, starting here with the Stewardship Center. The function of this building is really to accommodate staff and staff interactions, largely internally to Lancaster County Conservancy. It'll really have two entry points. The one entry point more on the public side, on the uphill side, which you see in that rendering. And what you're really looking at is a view as you come down the driveway here at the building. And then there'll be another entry as you wrap around the building from the backside, really hidden from view. Uh, on the lower side of the building. This is out of the view, out of public access, really for safety. We really need to have somewhat of a separation between the equipment and where uh, people from the public can go. So in summary, this design approach really lets us um, nestle this building into the hill, uh, lets us find an appropriate scale for this building while supporting all the functions that Lancaster County uh, Conservancy needs to have and deal with safety requirements. Internally to the building, which you see two representative plans on the left, the building itself will share functions between the staff on both floors. So we can make sure that the Lancaster County Conservancy people can interact and collaborate. On the lower level, which is on the lower side of this uh, slide, 
we really have equipment and tool storage with some support spaces for Lancaster County Conservancy. And above, we really have the office requirements and some of the collaboration spaces. So these, these uh, different sides of Lancaster Conservancy can collaborate together in, in, uh, in various rooms. Okay, going to the next slide then, if you don't mind, Sarah. Thank you. Switching to the smallest building in an effort to save and represent some of the history of the site, we're looking at a lighter touch to the cabin and, and making this into a volunteer station with a lounge area that you can see in the plan. And this is a place for the community to come together, supplemented with support spaces for storage and for bathrooms. We're planning for an outdoor pavilion that, that Sarah spoke about uh, touching that field as well. And this would really be on the forest edge where you can see above or uh, above the understory for educational purposes, but beneath the canopy of the trees and right there next to where we we're gonna have the food forest. Okay, so now back to Pete. Hey, Scott. So as you can see at these two sites, there are lots and lots of moving parts. And uh, for any organization, this is a challenging assignment to move forward with uh, all of the improvements and ecological enhancements that we talked about. So the natural question is, what do, what do we tackle first? And so we've been working with Concert the Conservancy to determine that. And certainly, you know, conservation being the focus of, of all of this, uh, work, the conservation uh, uh, studies of stream hydrology are, are the first step in terms of understanding the, the dynamics of those streams uh, is going to be one of the initial uh, additional studies, but also expanded hunting because we have to get the deer population under control to reduce and minimize the damage to the uh, 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 flora on the site, which also affects, as you know, things like songbird songbird populations. In terms of some of the um, more uh, physical improvements at Hellam Hills, we wanna have some parking improvements soon so that we can get cars off of the roadways, which is a safety concern. So we don't have people uh, parked along roadways where people are zooming by. Uh, the Mason Dixon Trail rerouting is, is a big project in and of itself. And we have to take these conceptual ideas and design and engineer them so that they're sustainable in terms of slopes and and gradients and uh, uh, everything else uh, you know in terms of drainage and those types of things that go into trails uh, so that's a major project and also the buzzard roost overlook trail which um, we want to bring people to uh, because it's such a great spot to be able to look over the river at wizard ranch uh, the stewardship center is an early uh, big project there in terms of being able to have a conservancy staff on site. Uh, so they have the capability to do a lot of this work and to maintain it. I mentioned earlier that the conservancy already has in hand uh, funding for bird and bat habitat and meadow edge um, enhancements. So that's gonna be uh, an early project. Uh, again, in, in conjunction with the stewardship center, uh, which would probably come before the Stewardship Center, having some public parking off of Accomack Road. So again, we get uh, people off of the edge of that roadway. And then also in terms of uh, education, getting uh, the educational pavilion up, which people will be able to walk to so that the Conservancy could start to do uh, events, outdoor events there where uh, folks could come. And, and that would also be done probably in conjunction with the cabin. So we have restrooms on the site. Uh, maybe porta potties in the first uh, part of that, but certainly having that cabin uh, renovated uh, as sort of a, a, a welcome center uh, for those programs. So those are some of the early things. And as you can imagine, there's a much, much longer list of things that will happen after those initial projects. So um, that is uh, really the conclusion of our um, uh, presentation for tonight. We have uh, approximately uh, 70 uh, people attending, if, if uh, you, you don't have that information. So thank you for everyone for coming out. Uh, there have been some uh, questions uh, that uh, Phil Wanger 
who's on the call tonight has been kind enough uh, to uh, address. And um, uh, uh, and, I, and I guess, I, I, Sarah and, and uh, Kelly, I'm not sure if folks attending can see those questions. Uh, if they have, they can't, maybe we could go over those. Um, so uh, one of the first questions from John Hare was, have you considered the concept uh, of E.O. Wilson of reserving the land for the exclusive use of wildlife? And, and, and Phil responded that uh, the conservancy is required by funders to open lands to the public. Uh, although, you know, Wilson's ideas are, are great, uh, the, you know, the human impact uh, in the preserves is going to be minimized, we feel. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that's just a, a, a fact in a conservation is uh, often to attract funders, you need to um, uh, have it available to the public. So there's a balance there in terms of making these facilities accessible to the public. So they learn, we all get educated when we go there, but also uh, become vested in supporting those. Um, uh, Mr. Hopper from the, from the Mason-Dixon Trail commented that uh, uh, some of the concepts on the, on the uh, trails uh, uh, maybe seem uh, uh, not feasible. And, and I think, as I mentioned, as Phil responded to Mr. Hopper, that these are, these are concepts uh, we, we need to fully engineer these trails uh, so that they are sustainable, so they drain properly, so um, that that is to be done as this plan uh, moves forward. And uh, uh, also, uh, it was a question from Tim who asked, uh, will the Mason-Dixon Trail uh, be developed in phases? And yes, this is, I mentioned, the, the Mason-Dixon Trail in itself is a big project. And so that's going to take several years. Um, part of the, the, the decision-making process is which parts of that trail can be developed sooner than later, which will take a little more time, but it's going to be a, a, a multi-year process to, uh, to go through uh, that um, design and engineering. Sarah, do you yeah. want to yeah. address so some of these? Yeah, so let me take over. We have some new questions coming in. Um, nearly 100 parking spaces up both preserves seems like a lot of parking. Can you give further information on how these estimates were determined and potential overuse by people? Yeah, I, I mean, there's, if, if you've been involved with development projects for parks, there are no uh, good standards that you can go to a reference book and say, oh, okay, we need X number of spaces. And these were developed based upon our experience, uh, the project team's experience, the conservancy's experience on uh, how facilities are used. Um, we have all gone to uh, uh, preserved open spaces over the last two years where um, they've been closed because there isn't enough parking. Uh, and uh, some people say, well, because of COVID, uh, our open spaces are being overused. Uh, I, I would take the opposite tact and say, we are undersupplied with open spaces that we can all enjoy. So one of the great things about trails is as linear systems, um, you could have, let's say all these hundred spots are filled and there's two people in each car. We have two, 200 people out on this trail system on a nice weekend, and you might not have too many interactions. So um, uh, they're, they're, we, we feel that these are based on estimates, the parking can be phased in also, it doesn't all have to be built at once. Sarah, do you have a comment too on that? No, I think that covers that. Okay, thanks. Um, coming from Dan Waco, will any biking be permitted on the property, either on trails or on the access roads running through both properties? Yeah, we've we've uh, as as you know, uh, we've had conversations with the biking community, and have have talked to them about the advisability of having biking or not having biking. It's not a, a use that's emphasized here. Um, we're not providing uh, biking trails per se. Uh, there, there, there could be like the emergency through road might uh, provide a, a, a route for cyclists, sort of like a gravel road where they could go through. Um, uh, but it's certainly not gonna be promoted by the Conservancy. Um, the Conservancy also, you know, over time, um, they, they do, having a presence on the site, it's one of the reasons they felt it's important to have a uh, facility at the Wizard Ranch site 
is going to give them eyes and ears on the facility. Uh, they certainly don't want to become an enforcer, uh, but um, again, it's not something that's going to be heavily promoted or promoted at all. But uh, but I think uh, some through biking on let's say that emergency access road might not necessarily be a bad thing for 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 cyclists who are going. Uh, not coming here as a destination, but going through. Okay. And as people, if people have questions, could have gone to Helen Hills there. Um. Any other questions that anyone has? And and again, uh, you've got the next this 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 presentation is going to be up on the Conservancy website. Uh, you'll be able to take more time. I mean, we went through a lot of information in about 50 minutes, so you'll have an opportunity to go through. I did see another yeah. question here. Yeah. Do you have the mileage estimates for the proposed hiking trails? Um, we will have that included. I know right now the, um, the re just to kind of put it in perspective, because I don't have the number um, right off my hand, head to give to Pete, but the Mason Dixon Trail kind of rerouted through Hellam Hills. Um, that's close to six miles. So in all, we're probably, you know, we're looking at, you know, the range of 10 to 20 miles of trails between both facilities. Um, yeah. And keeping in mind that those Wildcat, um, or I'm sorry, the Wizard Ranch Trails are really geared towards individual destination experiences. So it might be look a little more heavy trail there, but they're really kind of designed for specific activities. Right. And I think that number of mile, miles of trails also gets back to the previous question about, you know, is, is this site going to be overused? Um, I think most of the time there are going to be very few people here. And if you want to have a wilderness experience, quote unquote, uh, if you go there at five in the morning on a beautiful summer's day, you probably won't see too many people, if anyone. Uh, if you're there Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, you may see more people. But that number, that number of miles of trails, I think, is going to be really, uh, it's going to facilitate uh, a lot of people uh, to have a high quality experience. Yeah. Um, the next question, um, Pete, I'll let you kind of address it, and then we might want to um, direct it to Jesse. But do you have, do you view Norway spruce as invasive? Is is that why you are choosing to thin that stand? Yeah, I'd like to turn it over to Jesse right away because uh, I'm not going to give the right answer on that one, Jesse. Yes, uh, we do view Norway spruce as invasive. It's native to Europe, not North America. So it did not have species that co-adapted with it. So by having Norway spruce in that area, you're adding competition and blocking growth of native species that would be better adapted and provide better habitat and structure for the birds and animals that we're trying to have in this area. Yeah. And I would just add to that we did meet with um, the both the state game um, commission and the state foresters and one of the things that they both brought up was the idea that Pennsylvania as a whole has a very mature forest canopy. Um, and they kind of like the idea of having these young canopy opens where we can kind of diversify the tree age in the forest age throughout um, the area. So that's kind of another goal of that thinning out of that Norway spruce is kind of introducing that young woodland area into the site. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the ways that I've described it is a mosaic, like you would think of a tile mosaic or something, is a habitat mosaic. So by being able to have these different levels of structure, of having everything from a meadow to a successional forest to the second growth canopy and thinning it out in different areas, you're kind of softening the edges. So you're reducing this edge effect and then you're just creating more types of habitat. So that's, yeah, that's kind of building off of what Sarah said of just making this area a little bit more dynamic. Thanks, Jesse. Um, our next question, what are your thoughts on the possible disc golf course someday? Pete, yeah. do you want to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. We did we did look at that and we talked to um, uh, some folks who were uh, disc golf enthusiasts. And, and 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 in consultation with the conservancy, we we decided not to include it. There is a there are disc, disc golf courses in the area, and again, we're trying to provide for uh, experiences that aren't provided nearby. And so that was uh, really the primary reason why we did not include it. Um, there are actually two stone cabins at Wizard. It wasn't clear to me which one was to be converted and which one, what happens to the other cabin. 
Yeah, the one that uh, Sarah and Scott featured is is the one near Accomack Road, the one closest to Accomack Road. You're correct, uh, George. There is a second one just sort of up on the upper field. Um, we didn't feature that. I mean, our thoughts are to convert that uh, into, into a, a, a adaptively reuse that too, but more as an open uh, pavilion type of thing that could be used by both scouts and, and visitors. So we didn't feature that, uh, but, but good catch. And we do want to preserve and reuse that cabin also. Um, are there any baseline processes for the upland area habitat restorations away from evasives and back to native flora populations? Yeah, Jesse, do you want to address that? Yes. Um, so the baseline process is, um, they kind of just start with this analysis that we just made of seeing what's there. And then we look at other factors. We look at what's the soil type, what's the slope, um, you know, are we focusing on a specific uh, wildlife species that we want to bring back? So we start with, as we said, the removal of the invasives. So we look in and we don't want to take it all at once though. We want to keep the structure there as uh, my colleague that's not here, Mike always says, you know, birds don't care if it's a Lebec fin or a McDonald's, they'll, they'll eat it either one. There's just one that's going to be more sustainable for them. So it's okay for us to work in stages like this. And once we take care of the invasives, we'll immediately try to start seeding in or planting um, native populations so that those invasives don't have time to come back. And there's, I see the question below that. Can I, do you mind if I hit both yeah, of them? Yeah, go ahead. So these things kind of go hand in hand is, um, so Milo Minute, it's an annual, but the seed bank tends to go really deep. So that needs to be removed mechanically by hand over several years um, and lay down some really specific herbicides. You know, we don't want to over herbicide. We only want to use one necessary. Uh, but same thing with Tree of Heaven. We're going to have to uh, cut them down at the appropriate time of year when they're not going to send out all of their um, little shoots that they like to send out as a protective measure uh, and then basil bark them and then continuously do that for a couple of years and make sure that we're able to get them as they're coming out. So it's an iterative process and we have to keep going back and it will be a whole process of um, mechanical removal, some herbicides and then continuous plantings and suppression. So it just requires a lot of monitoring and diligence and maintenance and work from everybody. Yeah, and I'll kind of, just while we have Jesse, um, one of the chat questions came up was, what are the plans for increased pave areas for rainwater mitigation? Um, Accomack Road has already flooded once and had the creek worked on for those reasons. Um, and Pete, I'll let you kind of speak first to kind of the idea of engineering and permitting, but then also, Jesse, if you want to kind of talk to um, the floodplain restoration at um, Wizard Ranch and the benefits we'll see from that. Yes, Sarah, could you repeat that chat question again? Yeah, what are the plans with the increased paved areas for rainwater mitigation? Accomack yeah. Road has already flooded once. Yeah, yeah. certainly, um, you know, one of the one of the realities is the everything up upstream of Accomack Road, uh, there's not a lot of stormwater management going on. And certainly any uh, paved facilities, whether it's a, or impervious facilities, whether it's a building or a, a paving area, you know, we have to handle that stormwater on site, infiltrate it into the ground. And, and my guess is the conservancy will want to go to the extreme on that in terms of, you know, looking towards a zero runoff impact from those improvements. But on a, on a, on a larger uh, basis, you know, there's uh, education to be done in the entire watershed. Um, the work that was done in Accomack Road and the, and the creek is, is sort of mechanical, it's armoring. And the real work that has to be done is upstream of, of where that blowout was uh, for both the conservancy and uh, private property owners to, to make uh, incremental improvements in their properties to slow water down, to infiltrate it into the ground, uh, to use species uh, that are native and gonna absorb more water and, and do those incremental uh, um, improvements that are going to 
uh, hopefully over the long term, prevent uh, a blowout like you, we all saw a couple of years ago. So it's not a simple process, but uh, part of the mission of the Conservancy, besides preserving these lands, is educating all of us about the right ways to do things. And, and stormwater management is only going to become uh, a bigger issue as time goes on, not a smaller one. Yeah, I, I think that's a great explanation of the, the stormwater aspect. And then also, as Sarah was speaking to, the floodplains are really important. So the floodplains act as buffers for the water energy. They act as sinks uh, for water retention. Right now, there's a lot of altered hydrology at Wizard Ranch. So you have these areas that want to be wetlands, but due to roads, fields, other human things, uh, they've been disconnected. So instead of having these kind of wider floodplain flood benches for the water to disperse itself and take a little bit more time, you have everything rushing in in these large storm events and then coming and flooding out the road. So a lot of this watershed work that we want to do, you know, we want to encourage the entire watershed and the neighbors, but within this specific area, there will be um, more catchment basins and just kind of different areas. I mean, when you think of yeah, soft edge versus a hard edge, you have this soft edge that the water kind of hits and it's able to catch it and move back. Whereas when you have the harder edge, it hits it and then it bounces back and then you're kind of creating these energy ripples elsewhere in the system and you have that many hits to hard surfaces and hard structures, it's going to erode away. Whereas these more natural approaches actually do end up being more sustainable in the long run. That's a great explanation. Thank you, Jesse. Um, our next question from Mr. Wilson. I saw that one of the natives you wanted to plant is hemlock. Is there a way to protect them against woolly adalgid? I always have an issue with that word. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, <laughs> Jesse, go ahead. Uh, a couple parts to this. One, um, the best protection for any plant is healthy plants. So just in the general revitalization, restoration of this area of, you know, making sure the soils aren't compacted, that we're not um, adding a lot of pollutants, things like that, just having healthy hemlocks to start with, but they actually have started to come up with uh, systemic herbicides, um, basil bark treatments, um, soaps, like agricultural soaps and oils. So they actually have found ways that we've been able to protect and prevent this more. I, again, it just requires a little bit more diligence and monitoring because it could become an issue in the area. Um, from Rachel Goad, is there a draft master plan document with more details or is what's in the presentation what you're asking for feedback on? Yeah, we, there isn't a, a, a document available at this time and we are asking uh, people who want to comment to comment on this presentation. I mean, we tried to include uh, uh, as much detail as we could mm -hmm. without overwhelming the presentation so that you, you all have a good idea of what's being proposed. Yeah. And if there's any questions, I mean, we will be sharing our contact information at the end. If you have questions that maybe are more detailed than what's in the presentation, we're always available by phone or email um, and can provide you more information. Um, from Mr. Smith, will the hunting areas be open for the 2022 season? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I, I mean, that's a question for the Conservancy. I, at this point, I would doubt it because uh, certainly, there are things like signage and uh, parking. We, you know, we 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 really want to have some parking in place uh, so that there's places to, for people to park off the road. So, I I would think at the earliest would be 2023, and it might not even be by then, depending on how uh, the pace of those parking areas gets developed. Brandon, do you do you have anything to add to that, or? I do not think that okay. answer from Peter suffices. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then from Wendy, what are the plans for the old mining foundations at Dugan's Run, Helen Hills? Um, and Sarah, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think, um, so we saw, saw a lot of the runes throughout the site. Um, I think I personally haven't laid eyes on the ones near Dugan's Run, but in general, um, for Helen Hills, all those runes, we want to make sure that one, they're kind of, you know, kind of kept intact um, where appropriate, we give some interpretation, um, but also make sure that they don't become nuisances either. So we wanna make sure that 
people can view them, but they don't become a place that, you know, maybe people take a six pack on a weekend or something like that. So we'll have to kind of, there'll be a balance in that. But as we kind of move forward and def- with the engineering of trails, um, for the most part, we'll probably make sure that trails kind of run by those areas so that there are eyes and ears on them and you can kind of learn about them. Um, for Ms. Mr. Dietz, um, do you have an estimate on how soon parking will be available at Wizard Ranch? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the, the pat answer is as soon as possible. As you, as you, and it goes back to an earlier comment about stormwater runoff. As we develop these areas, even if it's a gravel parking area, that's going to have stormwater runoff. So we have to make sure that these plans meet with township requirements, state requirements for runoff, et cetera. So um, uh, I'm, I'm sure the Conservancy is going to have a conversation with the township in the near future about, you know, could there be a, uh, let's call it an interim parking area, both at Wizard Ranch and at Helm Hills, so that we can provide, get people off the road and give people a way to get into the site safely. Uh, so, you know, that, that just stay tuned. That's going to be a continuing conversation. But certainly the goal is to get people off the edges of the roadway, which is not a, a great uh, condition. Thanks, Pete. Um, we had another question pop up in the chat. Um, I think I heard you say that Wizard Ranch site is planned to be the Conservancy's public facing facility um, with the existing residents at Helm Hills. Why is Wizard preferred for this purpose? Yeah, I think um, the, the main reason is because, as we've mentioned many times, Wizard is much more highly disturbed than uh, Helm Hills. And um, we felt it's going to be a <clears throat> much more robust uh, location to engage the public in, in, in uh, ecological restoration principles and to, to be a showcase for that over time. Also, um, uh, if you compare the two sites, even though Hallam Hills Preserve is larger, there's probably going to be more intense work done by Conservancy staff at Wizard Ranch because of the state of degradation. So. Uh, that's really one of the, the primary reasons that we, we pick that site over, over the other. Yeah, and that kind of leads into the next question of, do you plan to recruit volunteers and assist with the land forest restoration? And I, I think that's one of the, the big programs that they envision at Wizard Ranch is that they will recruit volunteers. Um, I know, Brandon, you might want to speak to kind of your educational program where you're actually um, leading classes on trail building and invasive removals um, so that you're really kind of fostering that next generation of um, land managers. And that's kind of when we talk about the public face, we see that as, you know, where volunteers kind of come to learn um, and be involved. Um, I just, I, I switched over to that Wildcat Bluff image just to kind of, again, pick up on the idea that um, the public access to that residence is on River Road, um, which is a very narrow road. So that's, again, why we don't see that as being kind of a public face of the site. Um, when we went over the site, we talked about it being a hiked in facility. Right. Um, There's some other pl- uh, questions in chat, sir. Yeah. I am, I, I am going to just hit the last question we had um, in the Q&A um, from Matthew. Great to see the future expanded hunting areas. Deer populations are without a doubt extreme in these areas. How about other game species, i.e. turkey, small game, predators? Um, are there any opportunities for this? Yeah, that's going to be a conversation with the Conservancy and, uh, and the Game Commission. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anyone on the team has an answer to that, but I just don't know. So that's a something something to be determined. Yeah, I can answer that a bit here, Peter. Um, so the conservancy will only open a nature preserve to public hunting um, once we negotiate the terms um, and enter into cooperative agreement uh, with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. When we do that. Um, we adhere to our rules and regulations adhere to those of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. So therefore their wardens and deputies uh, can enforce those rules and regulations and those terms. Um, We can limit, as a private landowner, we can limit uh, what game is hunted for, uh, but as long as um, in, in, in conference with 
the Pennsylvania Game Commission, they feel like uh, particular populations are healthy as long as they're covered by rules and regulations by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We at the Conservancy try to allow for the greatest use of our nature preserves by the public for uh, uses such as hiking and hunting um, without it uh, diminishing the conservation values of that preserve. So as long as it's sustainable, we will consider it. And as long as the property is in active cooperative agreement with the Game Commission, uh, then we feel comfortable with that relationship and having their wardens and deputies assisting us uh, with everything from uh, planning and monitoring uh, through enforcement. Thanks. Um, we have one final question here. Um, you mentioned the possibility of future deer fencing. Is this a general concept or are there specific areas that would be considered to fence? Yeah, those are really exclosures. They're not um, uh, putting fencing up area wide and big areas there where we're doing uh, replanting of native species where we need to protect those uh, trees from deer rubbing. Uh, we would put fencing up around those to give them a, a chance to establish. So that's going to be on a, a site by site basis as the uh, replanting of natives goes forward. Okay, I'm just kind of going back through our chat here to see if there's additional questions in there. Um, we had one, I would imagine, based on the size and scale of a project, a robust traffic mitigation plan for private residents has been a requirement. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's really a uh, an issue to talk about with, with the township. Uh, typically on a project like this, and again, um, <clears throat> while it seems we're we are doing a lot on these sites, but most of the work is, is um, ecologically based. Um, we don't anticipate hordes of people being here. Uh, our experience is projects like this typically do not require traffic studies or traffic impact statements, or as you described it, a traffic mitigation plan. Um, so uh, certainly I'm sure that's gonna be a discussion point uh, with the township, but at this point, we're not anticipating that it would require uh, a, miti a traffic mitigation plan. There was a question in chat about uh, Lincoln's uh, presentation about uh, permaculture and wondering if he's been in contact with uh, the, uh, horn the farm. farm, horn farm. And yeah, Lincoln has, has talked to them, visited with them. The Horn Farm is, is really uh, very, very interested in the proposals here for agroforestry at the Helen Hills Conservation District. They've expressed interest uh, in the future to possibly uh, partner at some level uh, with the Conservancy uh, because this, this could feature uh, things that they don't necessarily do at their farm. So yes, we've been in contact with them. And there was an earlier co a comment at Wildcat about Wildcat Bluffs. Could you do residential permaculture there as a, uh, as a as an example? Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. So we will throw that uh, into the mix. And then um, just kind of going through the chat again, um, we had a question: How do you plan to produce police the lots at Wizard Ranch? Will the gate remain? Yeah, I th I think that's a a, a good question um, because the conservancy's going to have a presence there it's going to be uh, very easy for them to, at the end of the day, uh, lock the gate, if, if that's, the, that's the best thing to do, which seems like a reasonable uh, uh, operational uh, standard. Uh, certainly people can walk in to the site uh, at any time, but uh, you know, preventing people from driving in there uh, after hours uh, you know, pr prevents uh, possible vandalism, et cetera. So I think that would, probably be an operational thing that the Conservancy would do. Um, I'm just looking here. We had a comment from Lori Yike of DCNR, um, just very excited about the plan. She notes DCNR looks forward to working with local stakeholders in the Conservancies to develop strategic funding plans to implement the initial phases of development of the preserves. Does the study include maintenance cost and or MOU with local organizations for initial phases of development? Yeah, hi, Lori. Thanks for uh, attending the presentation. Appreciate it. Um, 
we, we are going to uh, talk with the Conservancy about maintenance costs. I mean, they have an ongoing maintenance operation, so they're going to be able to predict internally what, what they're going to need to budget over time for that. Uh, I don't think we have any MOUs presently between the Conservancy and local organizations, although I know uh, the Conservancy has been in contact uh, a, a lot with uh, area emergency responders. And, and some of those emergency responders, obviously members of the local community have been out to the site. Um, some of the trail networks uh, were developed with an eye towards uh, emergency uh, removals. I mean, at some point, somebody's gonna fall down and break their leg or something like that. So yeah, we, we've been in contact or the Conservancy has been in contact with them. It will continue uh, to, to do so. So it's a very important part. Uh, additional MOUs uh, would, would be great. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the Conservancy will be looking at that in the months and years ahead as this, as this facility starts to develop. So I'm not seeing any more questions at this point, Pete. Um, do you wanna head into the next steps and if any yeah, um, additional I, I questions are, come up? Sure, that was, that's, those are great. Thank you for all those questions, uh, really. Great questions. Um, so I mentioned earlier, the next steps are, uh, we'll have this uh, plan posted in a day or so on the Conservancy website and the presentation. <clears throat> we'll look forward to your comments. Uh, public meeting four is gonna be on the 30th of March. Sarah, if you can go to the next slide where, where yep. I think we have the, the uh, uh, Survey Monkey uh, ad address where you can uh, comment. Here's our contact information, Sarah and myself. So feel free to reach out to us and you can find our phone number, Simone Collins. We're in Norristown, Pennsylvania. So also feel free to give us a call. We'll be happy to talk to you. If we can't talk to you that second, we'll call you back. Uh, that's what we're here for, to listen to your uh, suggestions. And then when you see the, see the, uh, uh, the presentation on the Conservancy website, there's the link that you can go on SurveyMonkey and, and give us your comments or, and or questions. And again, if, uh, just really um, encourage you to give us a call or send us an email because you may have a question that's really more of a, or excuse me, a comment that's more of a question. And by having a conversation, we might be able to get, in, get into a conversation with you about uh, so, you know, what you have a question uh, about. And, and uh, George is one other question he just snuck in here, George Kane. I'm sure these efforts will provide numerous opportunities for the Boy Scouts to do service project, especially at Wizard Ranch. And, I, and I'm sure the Conservancy would welcome that. So again, thank you everybody for your participation. And we just wanna end with uh, Brandon Tennis uh, from the Conservancy with some uh, final thoughts. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. My name is Brandon Tennis and I'm the Senior Vice President of stewardship for the Lancaster Conservancy, and we are going this evening to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank you for participating in this meeting this evening and engaging in this planning process as we aim to do right by the natural landscape, its habitats and animals, our preserved neighbors, the local community, and our members and funders, with special thanks to the National Park Service and the Conservation Fund, BCNR, our Helm Hills Master Plan Steering Committee, our key stakeholders and integrated land management plan partners, as well, of course, as the Simone Collins design team. The Conservancy is pleased to have put forth the Helen Hills Master Plan as its first master plan for an entire conservation area, which consists of a grouping of multiple nature preserves and accounting for 1,041 acres. The need for this planning certainly exemplifies our success as a land trust in preserving our remaining natural lands. And furthermore, we trust that our intentional planning process illustrates our commitment to the collaborative, but mission-driven care and stewardship of the Conservancy's preserves. We encourage you to take this presentation of the draft master plan for the Helen Hills Conservation Area as your opportunity to provide critical feedback and affirmation as we pursue the final draft of the plan. As a reminder, Please keep in mind that a master plan represents all that can be, but not all at one time. It is a plan that guides our work and provides us sound options for well into the future. 
Nonetheless, we will begin early phases of implementation later this year and next with a focus on access, initial trails, and elements of ecological restoration. Once again, we thank you for your interest, your participation, and assistance as we plan for the best management of our collective natural lands, preserved in perpetuity and available for the untold generations of humans, animals, insects, plants, and ecosystems to come. We thank you.